All right, so we're going to talk a little bit tonight about biologic width. <clears throat> biologic width is a periodontal concept. Uh, the periodontists are probably the experts in this arena, uh, but I'm going to make the argument that restorative dentists need to understand this concept in much greater detail than they typically do. Uh, it's a very critical concept in the perio restorative world but we can really extra extrapolate that to just being the restorative world because our restorations often live uh, very close or underneath the periodontal margins. Therefore, we have to really know what's going on underneath. Uh, the concept is often misunderstood and we'll take a look at what that might be in a moment. Uh, and I make the, the case that restorative dentists must master this basic concept if they wanna have successful outcomes. So let's take a look here. Uh, this is a photo I got off the internet, but we've all seen crowns that have <clears throat> violated the biologic width and induced a, an inflammatory response, uh, something akin to this. Uh, this might be a bit on the exaggerated side. With that said, I have seen cases where uh, this was the, was the outcome. Was this a problem, problem of the patient not brushing their teeth? Yeah, that had a role to do with it, uh, but much of the time, the patient's inflammatory response is initiated not by poor plaque control, but invasion of the biologic width. So we're gonna to try to understand this a little bit more as we go through this tonight. What if this tooth shows up to your office? Uh, if this patient uh, had an emotional attachment to their teeth, and despite the fact that this tooth could be argued to be removed, uh, the patient just absolutely didn't want to do that. Their, parent, their parents had dentures. They just refused to, to have dentures. Is this a tooth you could predictably save? I think most people would say yes, but I would say yes as long as you understand how to deal with the periodontal complex that's uh, sitting around the tooth. Um, this particular tooth here on the facial has plenty of tooth structure, but if you look at the distal, you know, things are starting to get pretty thin there. Uh, if you're going to place a margin there and have a proper ferrule, you really want to know what's going on underneath the, the gingival margin. Let's take another example, say this patient here. Let's just say, for example, this patient is on bisphosphonates, therefore has a high risk of MRONJ, osteonecrosis of the jaw. Uh, for whatever reason, they're in active treatment and the doctor says they really shouldn't have any te teeth removed. Uh, can you do something for this patient? Now, one might argue that there would be a severe periodontal comprom or aesthetic compromise here, and yes, that might be true, but if you have to save the tooth, what are the tools in your toolbox that you have to save the tooth, and what are the factors necessary in order to, to deliver that care with that tool? I would say that you need to understand the concept of biologic width in order to save this tooth predictably. And lastly, this patient shows up, they're getting married in a week, they broke the tooth, definitely no time for an implant, they don't want a bridge. Can you save this tooth long term and have a predictable outcome? As with the other cases, I would make the argument that yes, if you truly understand the concepts of biologic width. So here we have an analogy, uh, the tip of the iceberg concept. Uh, where the tip of the iceberg is the tooth and i'm making the argument that what's underneath the surface is really the complex area it's the periodontal complex and there might be things that we are unaware of great white shark electric eel uh, things that we are unaccount not accounting for that might bite us in the long run and compromise the outcome so what are the things under the surface that we need to pay attention to Here's another diagram of, um, of a tooth restorative situation where the restorative dentist in this situation needs to understand what the ferrule is. Well, if you know what the ferrule is, you also need to know how much tooth structure you have available underneath the margin in order to have a predictable outcome. So let's take a look at what the periodontal complex is. And this uh, this diagram, or at least the measurements from this diagram, come from the, the classic Gargiulo Wentz Orban study in the 60s. Uh, we've all studied that in dental school, where uh, they made a series of measurements, took the averages, and found out what 
comprise the periodontal complex. Uh, these numbers have been studied. I believe there was a study in the early 90s that um, measured the same thing from a different perspective and got slightly different numbers. Uh, I think it's very important to understand that the numbers are not really consistent. There's quite a range. Both of the studies were really trying to find an exact number. Humans are variable. We're not going to have uh, consistent numbers from, from patient to patient. Therefore, we need to have some sort of algorithm to find out what each individual patient's uh, biologic width is so that we can account for it and be very exact in our calculation of where we can place restorative margins and whether or not we can do gingivectomies and crown lengthenings and things like that. All of those decisions really ride on the fact that we understand this concept very deep. I hope that we take away today that these numbers are, are great, they're guidelines that give us an idea. As a matter of fact, many patients often end up right around these numbers, but not everybody does. And it's really important that you know how to calculate that, and we're going to take a look at that in a moment. But before we do that, let's take a look at the various co um, components of the biologic width. Now here you can see there's three different factors here. We have the sulcus, the epithelial junction, and the connective tissue. It's very common that you'll see uh, dentists present the biologic width as all three of these. Uh, the sulcus is not part of the biologic width. Uh, I think the reason why this is often confused is because biologic width is thought as a distance from the bone up, and they often include the, the pocket, but in reality, as it's defined, the, the pocket is not part of the biologic width. The biologic width is the dynamic attachment of the periodontal complex to the tooth. The sulcus is not an attachment. Uh, the sulcus is lined with epithelium. Epithelium does not, at least in the case of the epithelial lining, does not attach to the enamel surface of the tooth. Um, not surprising, I think we all know that. As we move down into the actual biologic width, we have the first section, which is the epithelial junction. This averages about a millimeter in vertical height. Epithelial junction is the, I always think of it as the the very loose Velcro uh, that can unzip very quickly. It's a hemidesmo hemidesmosome attachment, which is a, a weaker attachment as compared to the next tissue, which is the connective tissue. Connective tissue is very adherent to the surface of the tooth. Uh, this is where uh, the attachment to the tooth is very strong. And this is the, the surface of the tooth, or the surface of the uh, periodontal complex that we very much want to account for when we're doing surgery. We want to understand what this tissue is. Uh, the takeaway here is that there's two different tissues. They are different in how they react and it's good for us to know wh what is underneath the surface uh, in the case of the uh, biologic width. It's also important to know that there's a couple different synonyms for these. As you can see here, the epithelial junction is also known as the long junctional epithelium and also the epithelial attachment. Likewise, the connective tissue is also known as the connective tissue attachment. Uh, that way, if you see these terms, you know that they are interchangeable. Uh, I do have a note here to talk a little bit about the electrosurge and the laser when it comes to um, removing the various types of tissue, and I think I'm going to dedicate a separate session on that. Just know, when you're using these tools, you really need to know what tissue are you removing. When you take a laser and electrosurge to uh, tissue, it's not all the same. The deeper you go, the higher risk you're going to incorporate different tissues, and you better know how those tissues are going to respond differently from each other. And that's something we will explore in that module. So here is the, the algorithm. Um, much of this came out of Spear. Spear really did a great job at, at explaining the concepts of uh, patients having different different kinds of bio or different quantities of biologic width. Uh, this algorithm is essentially a guideline so that you can learn what the biologic width is for each patient. So let's say, for example, you're working on number nine, as we looked at that example on the tooth earlier. Go ahead and measure number eight measure the healthy pocket, 
you can then anesthetize the patient, uh, anesthetizing the patient because you're getting them bone sound. Why do you need to do that? Because the connective tissue is highly innervated and definitely has um, the need to be anesthetized. Otherwise, the patient will feel uh, some, some, some significant discomfort. So once, you've get, once you get the bone sounding measurement, again, to the margin, margin is your reference point, you now have two measurements, the healthy pocket number one and the bone sounding measurement number three. Your biologic width is the difference between those two. It's the absolute difference between those two. If you then add 0.5 millimeters to that, this is how far from the bone you can place a restoration. Now this might be a subgingival restoration, it might be equigingival. Uh, you ultimately have to know what your pocket depths are going to be. Uh, that might get a little complex based upon the, the patient's uh, periodontal health, uh, but you should look at their other periodontal complexes to get a sense of what their pocket depths might be so that you can anticipate how much of a pocket you're going to need. So coming back to uh, this picture, or this is a new picture here, uh, just shows a different uh, diagrammatic representation of the different tissues. Again, super important to understand the difference between the two. Uh, this is the same slide here. The only difference is I added uh, the difference between number three and number five. Well, let me take a step back. Number five is adding 0.5 millimeters to number four. Again, this is how far away from the bone you can place a restoration. If you take the difference between number three and number five, this gives you the amount of tissue that you can remove without the risk of rebound. This is very important when it comes to assessing whether or not you can do a gingivectomy versus crown lengthening. This would be a great example of a situation where you probably want to know the difference between the two. Uh, bone sounding in this particular scenario would be very helpful. This patient has some sort of uh, eruption uh, pattern aberration. This could be passive eruption, delayed passive eruption, altered passive eruption, uh, any one of those alt altered active eruption. All of those diagnoses uh, might play a role here. You really don't know which one it is. Yes, you can look at a radiograph. There's other things we can do. The goal of this exercise was not to talk about diagnoses of these kinds of situations, but much of the diagnosis comes from the ability to bone sound. When you get that information, you can then make good decisions on whether or not you can do a gingivectomy or you have to resort to actual crown lengthening. So I'm going to end there. Um, there's a few other topics I want to bring in. Rebound, when does it happen, and can we predict it? Uh, I'm going to make a separate, uh, separate video on these concepts. Uh, nature's biologic width. Uh, there's this concept out there we hear it from time to time. Uh, about the concept of, well, if you just bury the margin and there's an inflammatory response, essentially you're going to have uh, a re resetting of the biologic width accordingly. Um, there's reasons why this kind of doesn't happen. Uh, it's a little more complex than I have time for today. Uh, but relying on this concept is just lazy dentistry. Uh, there's really no scientific rationale here. Uh, it's a common mistake that, well, if it worked once and it must work all the time, well, not everybody has hyperinflammatory responses. That doesn't mean it worked. It just mean that patient means that patient didn't necessarily respond. Uh, so drawing conclusions based upon small data sets is really what gets dentists and in, in, scientists and medical practitioners in pickles in the first place. Uh, we know this is not good practice. We have to create the space. Uh, there's a term called biologic shaping I'd love to go over. Very, very new concept that is really changing how we, how we treat this particular uh, entity in, in our everyday practice. And then finally, gingival biotypes and their relevance in restorative dentistry. So these are all concepts we'll get to. So key takeaways, biologic widths differ from person to person. Uh, calculating a patient's specific biologic width is critical for predictable perio restorative dentistry and using the simple algorithm that we went over can be used to determine when crown lengthening uh, needs to be done versus a gingivectomy. All right, hope this helps. Thank you.